and today we are talking muscle building. So right off the bat, hit us with some of your favorite protocols and just lay it out for us. I heard a really good line the other day, tension, muscular tension is the currency of muscle, of hypertrophy or muscle building. I was, I was like, I love that line. That's great. Yeah. So that is the goal of all training then is creating tension. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to break down tension before we get going. It's mechanical, right? We create a contraction of the sarcomere of that, that contractile unit within the muscle. And that creates a shortening effect of that muscle. And that elicits some sort of reaction, right? Whether that sarcomere contracts, fatigues, creates a lot of metabolic stress, or that sarcomere contracts enough and has enough tension that it actually breaks. And we have to adapt by adding more sarcomeres. And that would be adding more muscle cells or our contractile units within the muscle cell. And I, I think just simply breaking it down like that is important because a lot of times we can get detached from the actual mechanism that we're trying to elicit. And then we get to these like weird things. So for the, the person out there who's just listening to this, try not to get overwhelmed by high level discussion off of things like functional versus non-functional or myofibril versus sarcoplasmic. The truth is, it's not that black and white. It's not this binary. It's a lot more gray than it is actually separated in itself. But the premise, and you can imagine this muscle cell, that if we look at, if I want to have more functional, I want to increase the size of the muscle cell. If I want to have less functional or more sarcoplasmic, then I look at it from the premise of, I just want to increase the size of that area. And what the traditional performance coaches would say is, well, we need to have a function from that actual increase of the muscle, not just actually inflammation or swelling. So we want to improve the size of the muscle cell. And the default becomes, well, how do I accomplish that is higher intensity and lower weight and lower reps, this like five to six rep range, or this 20 to 40 seconds of time retention with this 75 to 85% intensity. And that's good until it's not. And one of the things that the body's really good at is, is adapting and finding some sort of, some sort of homeostasis. We talked a lot about this with our fat loss and our weight loss, right? The body's good at finding an equilibrium point and managing that equilibrium point and not want to leave that equilibrium. So this focus on one particular set and rep scheme at a certain intensity that we have li- very little reps in reserve, that if I had to ask you to like do more than six reps, you'd be like, I couldn't do more than one, that we're at a very high threshold intensity, then that's a good place to start, but it's also a very small window of opportunity. And maybe, just maybe, going outside of that and getting into this higher rep, lower intensity, you know, the 10 to 12 rep, maybe even more, and a lower intensity of this like 60 to 70% intensity of your rep max, all of a sudden, you know, we start to create more metabolic stress. We stop breaking down the muscle cell because we don't really have um, as much intensity on that actual muscle cell. It's not lengthening. It's not shortening with that much contractile force, but we create a lot of metabolic byproducts from that. Like calcium ions get released from that contraction. We start to release a lot of hydrogens. And then this creates a swelling effect in that muscle because the body's trying to find energy, produces a lot of lactic acid, and we don't produce as much. We don't go through this glycolytic pathway or glucose regulation as quickly as possible. So we're trying to create some sort of mechanism to get energy. And we have this built in slowing us down because we're getting to this fatigue state. And all the while that has an outcome of hypertrophy just wasn't perceived as functional for a long time because it's not heavy enough, or it doesn't have this like this kind of opinion or theory that it's leading into more functional hypertrophy. But One of the things that we're finding a lot with elite level athletes that do a specific higher intensity, lower rep scheme, whether it's to produce power, relative strength, or functional hypertrophy, is they're really poor fitness and they're going to really react to a very high metabolic stress. And I think that goes into this level of we're trying to create tension. And 
when I'm thinking about working with an athlete and you start giving an inventory of all the things you do, and I'm trying to bring value to you, I mean, a very simple of like, okay, well, you just haven't done a lot of this other thing. Probably a good opportunity there in some capacity, as well as we can look at parts throughout the year where a elite level athlete training in season, practicing a lot, doing a lot of lower rep, higher intensity things in season, because that's a high economic value from the time that we have in the weight room versus they're going to be completely devoid of doing this more metabolic stress, sarcoplasmic, non-functional hypertrophy. Again, these windows and the same thing for the gen pop person out there. Like I was told to do five by five and that's all I do. And I do that all the time death taxes and five by five on squat bench deadlift. And that that's good until it's not you plateau relatively quickly. Again, the body's good at finding equilibrium. So what I would say in that situation is, well, have we experimented with doing a higher rep scheme and playing around maybe with a different format with the workout. So we can keep some sort of lower rep scheme in the beginning and work our way into higher rep scheme. And we'll go through training programs like within a training session, as well as different protocols and methods. But what I want to, really bring apart here is this idea that there's not one better than the other. There's just an opportunity based off of what we've been doing redundantly, or maybe a more direct need based off an inventory that we find could bring the most value. And is this an arbitrary opinion to say one superior? It's just a different mechanism, but the end result is how do I create more tension in the muscle to elicit a larger muscle over time? And a lot of times it's, yes, double down on what we're, we need to do, or other times it's, we need to really focus on that. But of all that entire tangent, just take away one simple word, tension, and how do tension. we create it? So I wanted to get into tension and how range of motion potentially plays a role in tension. Because one thing I saw, or I'm having these conversations with my athletes here is like, why do we have to squat all the way to the bottom? And then it comes back to tension and how that relates to range of motion. So could you dive into that for us? Absolutely. So three forms of contractions. There is a lengthening or eccentric. There is the concentric or shortening. And then the final one is the isometric, which is a contraction without moving. Mm -hmm. I know that probably feels impossible, but right. imagine that you're trying to deadlift a car. You're not moving, but you're creating a lot of contraction, right? That, that feeling of I'm trying really hard, but it's not moving. That's an isometric contraction. That would be called an overcoming isometric contraction. So within those three phases, every exercise goes through those eccentric, isometric, and concentric phase. And when we're looking at range of motion, you know, that's kind of the work component, force times distance. And then we look at the time component where we apply to that eccentric, isometric, eccentric, we're putting controls on that. So we're thinking tension is the game plan and we have these three phases of contraction and that goes over a certain distance. And when I look at it from a, a how do I elicit an outcome? And I look at, I have a lot of athletes and I'm trying to think about what is gonna be the best thing for all of them to do that gives us the most bang for our buck here. It's okay, well, they're going to get some sort of eccentric, isometric, and concentric. And how do I organize that in a way to get the most value from that? And I start to allocate certain times to get that. And then I look at it from the other end of it. If I'm going a extended eccentric or a extended isometric, and that's in a non-controlled range of motion, I don't know what I'm getting. So it gets back into the, I want to get an outcome of increased muscular size. And I look at the controls I have from an input perspective of, all right, we're going to go some degree of time eccentrically, isometrically, and concentrically. I want to have the distance that travels in that conversation as well. So we're trying to create a muscle contraction to create tension, but that muscle contraction is through either short, eccentric, isometric, or concentric in terms of timeline or a limited range of motion. All we're doing is get, taking away from our tension potential. And we want to get the most bang for our buck from every single repetition. And we start off with, can they get through a full range of motion? And that's a pretty good question to ask. Can you move throughout a full range of motion and looking at each joint and its true function, like a knee joint is a hinge joint. Just imagine a door that opens and shuts. And if that door can't open all the way, how much of an impediment it has to walking through. Now the same thing from an exercise performance standpoint, if my knee can't flex, or my elbow can't flex, 
what kind of blockages or ceilings does that create to my exercise performance and my tension potential? All right, that's a, I'm going to coin that term. I feel like that's a, a new term here, tension potential. That's a good one. Tension yeah, I feel, like, I feel like it is. Listeners out there, remember the first time you heard that. And I want to make a point here too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am the originator of the outcomes, not solutions. Like people are copying that now. And my listeners, my, my rabid fans, make sure you guys are reminding everyone of that. But back to the tension potential conversation. Again, trademark, con- that's all Tim. This idea of range of motion and my potential for tension from that range of motion is a way to control that input to get the outcome. And all we're looking at it from, we're feeding in things into the machine and the machine spitting out something. And hopefully that is bigger, stronger, more robust muscles and range of motion. How long I spend eccentrically, isometrically, concentrically are just controls to those inputs. But we look at it too. There's a, conversation in finance around compounding interest, right? That every time I start to accrue more from the time I put in, if I have a certain restricted range of motion, whether that's pain or just not knowing what a, the benefit of going full range of motion is, we are going at with potential less interest. So if I'm going to get 10% interest on 10 bucks versus I'm going to get 10% interest on a hundred bucks, I want that 10% interest on hundred bucks. And that hundred bucks represents larger range of motion. Right. If I only go to top of the thigh parallel on my squat versus I go below parallel on my squat and I'm doing the same amount of reps with the same time under tension, the person going through a greater degree of range of motion will have greater potential for muscular size and development. And that's the theory here. And I don't think that's illogical. I think you could probably go, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Whether you have an opinion off the knee is fully designed to go through a full range of motion. And there's, there's people out there who say that's not, but I would tell you from an orthopedic standpoint, if you take away external load and that foot in contact with the ground, that if we don't have full range of motion of the knee, that knee is therefore deemed dysfunctional. One of the biggest tests coming off any knee surgery is full flexion of the knee and extension. Extension is kind of taken for granted. But if we don't have that, then therefore we deem that, that joint dysfunctional and at risk. Why would we take that away when we look at exercise perspective? And then why would we limit ourselves from potential to produce tension and get value from that exercise to a certain degree? So range of motion as a whole has two components. It's a control to create a standard of movement to hopefully better predict what's going to come. And evaluating whether we have that range of motion or not is a pretty good thing to figure out quickly. Then the other end of it, it's compounding to if everyone's doing 10 sets of 10 on squats and we have certain degrees of flexion of the knee for some people and more degrees for the other people that the person doing more degrees of flexion or going through a greater amount of work for his time's distance is going to get better results in that same allocated period of time or that allocated rep sets of rep scheme. So we definitely set up that tension and tension potential trademarked right here is mm-hmm. important. You've mentioned, you know, 20 to 40 seconds of time under tension and then potentially getting away from that going into higher reps, that 10 to 12 plus rep range. What are some protocols that you typically go to in terms of time under tension, reps, all that? You start off with that. Every set has to reach a certain window of time. Mm -hmm. And we're already talked about range of motion. Position and range of motion is another really big thing to talk about as well. And I don't want to get back into biomechanics, but... If my mechanical advantage is changed to accommodate that range of motion, then therefore I lose tension potential in that, in that range, right? So if my chest is below my knees on a squat, or if my knees are bent on a hinge, then I'm taking tension off that targeted muscle group. Movements, not muscles, but don't forget muscles are the things we're training when we're going through these movements. Again, another trademark there. Going into this time under tension, and again, this is a theory, right? And I've gotten into discussions with coaches on this saying like, this is just a made up thing. Yes, I get it. Everything's made up, right? There's nothing, (laughs) it's all made up, right? Nothing's, nothing's universally like accepted, right? We could change that. We can go into Goodell's theorem and all all of a sudden look at it. All arithmetic is just made up, right? If I just change the, the, the variables, then we have this completely unending sequence of just chaos. But the truth is, doesn't change the fact that eventually we got to do something with someone and we want to see the cause and effect relationship from allocating stress. So if I look at it, 20 to 40 seconds, you get more of this myofibril or functional hypertrophy, 
and I hate that term, but we're just going to use it for context. And then we get into this 40 to 70 seconds as a sarcoplasmic or this more metabolic stress or traditional hypertrophy. I can start to look at it, the cause and effect relationship. And I can say, Corey, has got a weightlifting background. So he did a lot of twos and threes, a lot of compound movements with snatch, clean squats. And he says, I really want to improve my body comp or I want to add lean muscle. I just got moved from tight end to offensive line. I need to add body mass, but I want it to be functional body mass. I could double down and say, all right, we're just going to do a lot more sets of twos and threes. And maybe I get up to sets of four and five. And you're like, damn, that's cardio. It's, okay. Or I can say, hey, this is a good window to work in more of these. I have a hypothesis that Corey has a background in weightlifting. And this is a true story, by the way. This isn't just made up. But I had a hypothesis yeah. Yeah, with Corey of he told me his high school strength training program is a lot of snatch, a lot of cleans, a lot of jerks, a lot of squatting, a lot of twos and threes, which is great. It's awesome foundation. But then he got moved to a position of offensive line where his body mass had increased tremendously. And I need to figure out a solution to help that person play at a high level. All right, I have a, he's at 240 pounds and he's at 20% body fat. How do I get him to 250 pounds, 260 pounds, and even decrease body fat, but increase lean muscle? What if I did 40 to 70 seconds per set and did maybe that for three to four weeks? And then I evaluate it. His start point was this, and he improved his lean muscle. Guess what? Hypothesis was accurate. The testing means and measurement was accurate. So I did a good job. That's my point here is when we're looking at allocating stress, good research design, we're having controls on that stress and start to look at this objectively and saying, I need to effectively evaluate my impact here. And I want to control that stress with that input somehow, some way. And it's the ones that kind of get dismissive off like eh, range of motion doesn't really matter or the time it takes to go through an eccentric isometric concentric contraction doesn't really matter or the timing of that set doesn't really matter i find you're just getting outcomes that are less a product of their direct direct input maybe more of circumstance or luck and i don't want that I don't want that doubt. I don't want to have a hesitancy in that. And if you're looking at this from I'm working out my own and I don't really know what to do next. I just want to put on muscle. I was told on Reddit to do five by five of squat bench and deadlift. And if you're listening to this and you're going through Reddit, stop. If you're going through influencers, stop. You got one good resource, trademark tension potential. Yep, right here. Right here. Like here's a quick pro tip. Try to do something you're not doing or do something you're not really good at and see the benefit of that, but test it. Say, all right, look, evaluate how long a set takes and where do you spend, where's your pie chart distribution of how long a set takes? And then look at it from, okay, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a crossover design on myself here. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna do 40 to 70 seconds for a period of time and see what happens. And you might have this mixed approach, meaning I'm going to do more of this conjugate style, or I'm going to do power, relative strength, and then more hypertrophy at the end. That's fine. It's completely okay to do that style of programming. Maybe it's time to change that up, though, and get more of a block and a focused effect. Like, I'm just going to commit to hypertrophy for a month and see what happens. It's this idea of, hey, just inventory what you're doing and figure out why you plateaued, because the body's good at finding equilibrium, and then try to evaluate other things. But back to your original question of I got 20 to 40 seconds for more of this myofibril, probably a lot of people in terms of strength to power athletes are focusing on a lot. So a lot of untapped potential for this 40 to 70. And then we can look at it from another level of maybe I have a lot of bodybuilders that are listening to this. And I hope you are. And you go, okay, like I do sets of 12 all the time. And I do three sets of 12 and I try to hit 20 to 30 sets per body part. Okay, well, maybe mix it up. Get a different training split. Maybe look at a three-day total body or a four-day upper or lower and then look at it from, I'm going to work a little bit more of this functional myofibril and work a little bit of power, work a little bit under 20 seconds of time and retention to get higher intent. Maybe I want to work a little bit of this functional hypertrophy of 20 to 40 seconds. So doing a set of four to six reps with a 4 exo tempo. So four-second eccentric, no pause in the contracted, explosive on the way up, no pause in the relaxed position, repeat, and see what happens and do the evaluation pre and post. And okay, that was a good input. And that's all this is, just good research methods.
As far as research design, you know, you mentioned mixing it up, doing things you're not already doing. It's not doing a new thing every day, new thing every week, right? That would be mm -hmm. bad science and you wouldn't get any good data from that, would you? No, yeah, agreed. And I think a lot of it comes down from reverse engineering the, the outcome. You know, I, mm -hmm. I look at periodization or long-term planning is either going from a weakness, developing that into a strength, or coming from an outcome and finding a solution based off where you're at in the beginning. You're going in two different directions, right? Forward to the end or working backwards from the end. There's no right or wrong. Sometimes you're kind of forced to your hand of, I got to work on, I, this person's like, got a, just a lot of damage and they're broken from the se from competitive season or they're just doing a lot of crappy training before. I got to re I got to rebuild them, right? They're the, they're the bionic man and I need to completely build them back up from scratch and get them confident in the weight room and I need to develop function and movement and just overall confidence. But then other times it's like, hey, I want to get show ready. I got 12 weeks. I got to get down to 5% body fat and I got to add 10 pounds of lean muscle mass. And like, okay, let's look at inventory of what you're doing and find out where I can bring the most value and service. And, oh, wow, you've been doing a lot of traditional powerlifting stuff, right? So case study, let's say that we're working with a bodybuilder that just does pretty hardcore squat bench deadlift type of programming. I'm gonna look at it from, okay, well, can we get accessibility to some machines and can we target specific tissues in certain parts of your body with 40 to 70 seconds of time and attention for about four sets and see the cause and effect relationship, not just from an overall body composition, but for some circumference, right? Bodybuilding, most people don't realize is not necessarily size, but symmetry. And the, the ratios of, of upper arm to neck to calves need to be in line, right? That's a pretty good indicator if your body is symmetrically developed. Do you have the same neck circumference, upper, upper arm or bicep, or in the same calf circumference? And it kind of leaves a breadcrumb trail of what you do or don't do, right? I have a, a pretty good indication of, of a person with skinny calves and skinny forearms, but very developed like Ninja Turtle-like body. Like, okay, they do a lot of deadlifting, probably sumo deadlifting. That's why they look, in my opinion, odd. I look at that of like, that person need to get show ready. Okay, I need to develop their extremities. I need to develop their lower and upper arms or lower and upper legs. And they might have been really accustomed to finding the best biomechanics to get as much weight off the ground, widen their feet, put their hands inside, try to limit range of motion, get some straps, whatever. I get it. You had an objective to get as much weight off the ground as possible. But now we have a different goal. And I have to inventory all this stuff. And all I'm trying to do with that 40 to 70 seconds in that bicep area is seeing the cause and effect relationship from the change in circumference and muscle size. And look at it not just from, okay, well, they're stronger. But is that actual muscle bigger? And is it bigger, relatively speaking, to a very overdeveloped torso? And you might get a bodybuilder that all they do is buys and tries and calves. They're really self-conscious and they wear no sleeves all the time and they wear shorts. Okay, I gotta develop some quads, some hammies, some glutes. I gotta work some pecs and lats. I gotta make them more physically developed from proximal to distal. And the same thing, like I'm gonna hammer those tissues in those areas to get that development there. And one of the things from a strength coach, so we have a couple different people probably listening to this. We have gen pop people who are like, I just wanna get bigger and stronger and I want to feel better and I want to look better. Great. You have the tension component. You have the 20 to 40 seconds to work more myofibro or more functional hypertrophy. You have 40 to 70 seconds. But the strength coach out there that may or may not be listening to this, you have a pretty, pretty much a limited job of getting them faster, getting them stronger, and then making them more resilient. But I would tell you the area that you're probably most neglecting is the anatomy in which we move and looking at the engineering of some of these machines and looking at how to create tension in a muscle. And there's a wealth of knowledge out there from a lot of bodybuilding coaches that not only know how to improve body composition, but to develop specific muscles and not only developing specific, specific muscles, but shaping that muscle in a certain way by just having that arm or that, that arm or that leg positioned in a certain way to create tension in a certain part. Right. And one of the areas I find very, very, very illuminating about the thoughtfulness about all exercises, this premise of there's 
primary and accessory exercises. And there's a line that I got from a coach that I work with. There's no such thing as extra work. It's either necessary or unnecessary. If you right. need to do it, it is therefore necessary. So if it's something that we are required to develop, and we could look at it, there's a maybe a negative stigmatism of developing the by and try or the forearm, but there's not associated with developing the lower leg, the, the calf and tip interior. I would sit there and say, we are arbitrarily choosing one over the other. And we need to be very adequate in understanding, okay, well, this may not be a high priority thing, but if we're going to train it, I need to understand how it functions. I need to understand how it operates. I need to understand how it creates architectural changes. I need to understand if that arm is in this extended position versus this flex position. What is going to be the difference in terms of contraction of that muscle? And then I have to go to work of programming that and I have to figure out, do I have all the tools at my disposal? So let's say I want to do a semi-flex position like a preacher curl or Scott curl for the ones that really know. It's a Scott curl, guys. Come on. And we look at that saying that's going to be developing more of this peak or the separation from that bicep from the forearm. Right? And we look at some of the bigger development there and creating a higher peak in that muscle. And how would that attribute to potentially looking at it from the calf? And we look at both of these areas like they're kind of similar. The elbow and the knee are very similar in terms of function. And if I know how to train the knee, I should know how to train the elbow. And I look at the calf from a leg extended position, which is maybe get more gastroc. And if I look at it from a leg flex, maybe get more soleus. And that soleus might be more interconnected with that Achilles tendon. But maybe that extended position of the bicep might get a little bit more of that bicep, that more proximal bicep tendon. Versus if I look at it from the other end, if I'm more of a preacher curl position or a Scott curl position, the right way to frame that, I might get more of that distal. And all the while, you're just becoming more of a, a more of aware or conscious strength conditioning coach. You're not diminishing your skill set by understanding functional anatomy and anatomy and engineering of some of these things a little bit better. And if you're getting your ass kicked by a bodybuilding coach and you're going, well, he's just an idiot. All he does is work with bodybuilders. I would look at it from you have a really missed opportunity there. And you have a great window to develop athletes in a way that you probably aren't developing them. And then it gets rid of this notion of functional versus non-functional or myofibril versus sarcoplasmic. We basically strip away what all these biases and agendas are. Like I work with athletes. All I do is under three reps and I just do functional hypertrophy. All right. No, you don't. You have a problem in front of you. You need to find, you need to find the outcome you want to get to and form the best solutions based off that outcome. And that could come from, hey, I'm going to do isolated training and work more non-functional hypertrophy. That's what I'm saying here. And the protocols that go with it, just plug and play, right? If that person has a need to develop more functional hypertrophy, okay, great. And then if they are potentially going to benefit from increasing their eccentric stress or their time of retention, because the other component I didn't mention is eccentric is always stronger than concentric. So if I have a limiting capacity from a concentric ability, and that has a lowered ceiling of what I could do in terms of overall external load, I'm just going to increase the external load via more time eccentrically, which I'm naturally stronger. And if I want to produce more force or get more external load to create more tension, spending more time eccentrically is a great way to get that effect without having to get these fancy tools. It's just spending more of that period of work, force times distance, in this time variant of eccentric as opposed to just focusing on a equal distribution between eccentric and concentric. But then we tie it into, okay, certain angles, you're going to be mechanically weak and understanding that the body's always going to find a way to find some sort of mechanical advantage. And we look at the difference between flexor and extensors. And we can get this whole concept of gear ratio and more extensor-based muscles are going to have more sarcomeres in there because they're more penne orientation. And then more flexor-based muscles are going to be mechanically advantaged because we start off in a extended position and they have this more parallel muscle fiber or this more distal to proximal muscle fiber and less sarcomeres. But the point being is you look at that going, oh, wow, I can't flex as much as I extend or I can't pull, I can't pull as much as I push. I wonder why that is. And I start to look at it from what is that leaving on the table in terms of all I do is squat, hinge, push, and pull. I don't really ever do some of these like direct isolated things. And we're never forced to learn or grow from a, a biomechanics and understanding the engineering, the architectural changes we can have. And then, and then we strip away all of the nonsense of, well, one thing is better than the other. It's not. It's just, not, it's just a different solution to a different problem. I don't think I answered your question at all on that, but I felt like it was necessary to say that. You were um, rolling, though. I was, man. Yeah. God dang. Strength coach, be better, man. Be better. Woo.
Just talk about the the depths that a good strength coach could get into there. So yeah. maybe he lost some of our general listeners, but for no, our strength, oh yeah, you guys got like, it. You you guys get got on it. the website now and sign up yeah. for a membership if you're trying to get at at that level. God dang, man. Yeah, level one, man. Level one. I got gear ratio module. It's probably the most complicated module as well, as well as get strength deficit, man. I got I talk about gear ratio in there and bomb and mechanical advantage. So most underrated book in all of strength and conditioning, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Corey. All right, Tim. This was great. Tension potential. Don't ever forget it. That's it, man. Tension potential, outcomes, outcomes, not solutions. Tim Karen trademark. Ooh. All right.